All right, my renowned fam, welcome back to the Renowned Leadership Podcast. I am your amazing host, Stephen Morris. And as always, thank you so much for joining us today. And today I have a very, very special guest, my brother in arms, all the way from Stuttgart, Germany, Colonel Damon Wells. Colonel, welcome to the show. It is a true honor to have you here, sir. Hey, thanks a lot, Stephen. I really appreciate you inviting me and I'm very glad to be here. That is awesome. So before we get started, Colonel, just go ahead and uh, dive in, to introduce yourself to the people, tell everybody what you're all about and pretty much why they should listen to you. Yeah, so I'm Damon Wells. I'm currently an Army Colonel on active duty uh, here, in, like you said, in Stuttgart, Germany. Uh, I'm in Africa Command. Uh, it's I work current operations and I work crisis programs here. Africa Command is the headquarters uh, for the U.S. military that sort of oversees the continent of Africa. A little weird that it's in Germany, but that's just kind of how it worked out. Um, some history, I joined the Army uh, back in 1995. Um, since then, I've you know obviously been stationed uh, all around the U.S. Uh, been stationed in Korea, the Baltics, Kuwait, did a couple, couple tours in uh, Iraq, one in Afghanistan, and of course, uh, now I'm in Germany. I'm a field artillery officer by trade, so that's cannons and rockets. Um, and my last job, I was the uh, commander of the Division Artillery for 4th Infantry Division in Fort Carson, Colorado. Um, I also commanded a rocket battalion in Fort Sill, Oklahoma. That was 220th Field Artillery. I'm so I sorry. Fort Sill sucks. <laughs> you know what? I got used to it, and it, it wasn't the worst. It's It's small enough, and it's a decent little hometown, but... Uh, it's got its downsides too. <laughs> Fair sorry, enough. Go ahead. Go ahead. No worries. Um, so yeah, I've worked in staff positions, which are, are not my favorite, but a you know requisite for the job. Up up to four star headquarters, which is where I am now. Um, some other stuff. I've, I've taught combatives and boxing at West Point Military Academy when I was a major. Um, you know, some cool stuff. The Army, before that job, the Army sent me to Texas A&M to get a master's degree in kinesiology, exercise physiology. I earned another master's from the Army War College. Um, so, uh, you know, that equals 20, about 20 and a half years. Um, so um, I'm getting close to that 30 year retirement mark. So I'm starting to look at options for post Army career right now. And I think that about wraps it up. <laughs> what, what an incredible uh, career. It doesn't, mine doesn't even pale in comparison to yours. Um, 28 <laughs> years, man. I, good God, 16 years was hard. I could not imagine going past 20. Um, I, yeah, I definitely I'd like to say it flies by, but there are certain, uh, you know, certain phases of it that certainly do not fly by. No, no. The, and, and uh, you know, honestly, be, I, I joined the army, uh, August, 2001, right before September 11th happened. And, um, so pretty much my entire, entire army career was what we call wartime army uh -huh. and wartime army is different than garrison army. So garrison army is peacetime army. Everybody's back home. Wartime army are obviously everybody's deployed forward to combat it. So my entire career was, uh, and I know, you know, that I'm explaining that to the audience, For sure. um, uh, but so my entire career was wartime army. And when we started to wind down, um, to, to more of the peacetime army, I was actually a little bit relieved, um, to, to get that med board because I don't think peacetime army was for me because it's two completely different monsters. And yeah. I'm sure you can attest to that going from peacetime army to wartime army back to peacetime army. Um, which is incredible. Yeah. You're one of the few people I've met, I've talked to that have that experience. Yeah, I'll tell you, man, that's, I, I didn't realize that as a, as a young officer until one of my bosses said, Hey, you know, I was probably my second tour in Iraq. And he said, Hey, I, you know, I'm glad to be going to Iraq. It's life is so much simpler when you're deployed. Um, I was like, yeah, actually. Yeah, you're right. Um, we, we tend to uh, cling to the bureaucracy when we can, when we're, you know, back in garrison, um, it, you know, it's, it's meetings and it's overly complicated processes where when you're deployed, man, there's just, you know, life is pretty simple. You've got one or two things you really have to do. <laughs> and other than that, you just take care of your team and uh, it, it gets simplified. And 
I would say for, for most of us, that's sort of what we thought we were getting into, um, especially for a senior officer when you talk garrison, um, just so much bureaucracy and, and so much stuff you didn't see yourself doing, you know, a couple <laughs> of days prior, you know. <laughs> the other bureaucracy. And just so for the listeners that aren't military, um, the bureaucracy that he's talking about is so insane. Like just to take a vehicle out of the motor pool is a two hour long process sometimes. Like yeah. it, it's insane the amount of, of paperwork and, and the insanity and the pointless meetings and the 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 rehearsals. Good God, the rehearsals. The rehearsal for the rehearsal <laughs> for the command retirement ceremony. Yeah. Like, and that's not even an exaggeration. We would do a rehearsal for a rehearsal. And yeah, it, absolutely. <laughs> I'm like, doing rehearsals I, for meetings. Yeah, rehearsals for meetings, you know, because you know, general so and so is coming and you can't you can't screw it up. And so I understand part of it, but go ahead. Yeah, so yeah, I, you were getting ready to probably say uh something similar to what I'm gonna say. And I, you you know, the longer you're around, the more you start to see, well, we're doing this because we're trying to solve a problem. Like if we if we don't do something like this, it will inevitably create some kind of problem that we'll, we're going to have to solve after the problem happens. Um, but, you know, this goes to some of my, you know, some of my views on leadership and team building is you can only so solve so many problems from four echelons above the problem. Like you, you've got to, you've got to release uh, authority and you've got to trust junior leaders to, to just do the right thing. You don't need to give them very prescriptive you know, overly uh, complicated plans to make sure that they get it right. Yeah, I love that. And we're going to dive into your P4 concept here in a little bit. But, um, you know, I, but, and I was actually, I wanted to touch on junior leaders first. So I'm glad you brought that up because uh -huh. uh, I was just in a meeting and I, and I was talking to, to a person and I was like, you know, delegation, I understand it's hard, but delegation is one of the single most important things a leader can do. It is so important, but a lot of times we don't like to delegate because we feel guilty. We feel like we're being lazy or we feel like it's too important. We should be doing it or whatever, because apparently we're, we're the most important thing in the universe. And, but it, these are the emotions a lot of times we feel when it comes to delegation. How, how have you uh, approached the, the, the art of delegation when it comes to building up your junior leaders? Yeah. So a couple interesting things there. You're, you're right. Like uh, young leaders, there's this transition point somewhere around when they're a captain, maybe as they become a commander, may, maybe a little later than that, maybe major when they're a kind of a staff officer in a battalion where um, all the tasks they get, they're, they're capable of doing it. So, you know, they're probably the best person they know of to get the task done because they know exactly how they want it done. Um, so, so it's tough to relinquish responsibility for a task and let somebody else do it about maybe half as good as you could do it and then spend the time getting them to where it needs to be, which, which, you know, maybe takes twice as long as it would have taken you. Um, another thing on that is, you know, once you reach that sort of pivot point in your career where you're kind of, you got to acknowledge, I, I can't do all of this stuff. Um, I've got to delegate it out. So that that's the point where you have to learn how to communicate really well. That's a, that's another uh, important facet of leadership is being able to communicate really well. And I think I'm a pretty good communicator, but I tell you, even in my last job as a, as a commander, um, missing the mark on what I thought I expressed, you know, an idea I had or something that, that I thought I explained brilliantly uh, that came back uh, kind of, you know, not hitting the mark because, because it wasn't received like I thought it was. Um, yeah. And then you got to know, there's another kind of thing that it took me about, I don't know, about 15 years to figure out, you got to know your personality style. So some people are high and conscientious as they want to hold on to the things and they, they sort of have this good, they feel good about the project if they're the ones doing it and they don't get that feeling from delegating, explaining the task well, and then working with someone else to get the task where it needs to be. Um, so I, I, I ended up kind of understanding myself better and, and learning that I can, uh, I can delegate and help someone get a project to where it needs to be 
And that actually feels better to me than doing the project myself, if that makes sense. Yeah, totally. Totally does. And, and I agree. And I think, I think that's the work a lot of leaders miss the mark on is that self-reflection because you really do have to look at yourself deep in the mirror for a solid two hours and just look as deep into your soul as you can and, and really learn yourself. Because like you said, once you learn yourself, a lot of things that people tell you like, oh, leaders should do this, but that doesn't come natural to you. But there, there's naturally a solution to that problem in your person built into your personality. And once you understand who you are, a lot of times those things can naturally come out and make you all the better leader. Um, the other thing you touched on was communication. And I think it's funny when people are like, oh, I'm a great communicator. <laughs> no, you're not. <laughs> we can always be better communicators. Um, and a lot of times uh, we, for and I, I, I think especially in the military um, or in the academic world, we feel like everybody needs to be on our level or everyone is on our level. So when we speak, we speak on our level. But we forget the the private Joe Snuffy or Butterbar, you know, second lieutenant Joe Snuffy. They they've been around the army for all of two seconds and they know absolutely nothing about it. So when we're speaking, everything's just going over their head. And that is one of the I would say that's my strongest capability when it comes to communication is I always try to take who I'm speaking to into account and not dumb it down, but dumb it down to their level. And I don't mean dumb to be an insult. It's, you know, I guess more ignorance than stupidity, but at the same time, like I got to speak on a level that they understand, even if it's 10 levels underneath me. And so communication <laughs> like if you're listening like just understand you are not as good at communicating as you think you might be yeah because so. it's hard to see it from the other person's perspective perspective let me tell you something i did when i was a battalion commander so we're talking about junior officers and how do you uh you know how do you develop officers from that very junior level so when second lieutenants would arrive to the unit and that's straight out of basically straight out of college and then into, you know, a quick, uh, quick sort of military transition. And then, and then right into the army. So you, you're, you're in the army as an officer in charge of people. And it's like your first months in the army. So, you know, very little. So as they arrived, um, I did a sort of shadow program where they, you know, their first day they came in and they, they basically met me and stayed in my office or, or stayed with me, not necessarily in the office, but stayed with me for about four or five days um, just to kind of, first of all, to understand that I'm not a horrible monster because that's what the battalion commander looks like when you're a second lieutenant. Um, so just to kind of talk to me and have normal conversations, uh, you know, because they, they wouldn't do it. Uh, otherwise, it would take them a couple of years to actually have a normal conversation with the, with the battalion commander in some cases. Um, and then really to, to let those, those new lieutenants just ask me kind of anything, like just whatever, family life, you know, where am I from, background, why did I join the army, what, what is this thing that in our unit that I've never heard of, like any, literally any question and that, those were pretty enlightening, especially when I had four or five at a time, it was fun uh, to sort of introduce those guys to the, to the army. Um, I would have them read, you know, leadership related articles and, uh, we, we just talk about it. And one of the most powerful things was that let's, if they're literally with me all day, then they see when the Sergeant major comes in my office and says, Hey, we, you know, this problem, whatever, we've got to, we've got to figure this out. When the three comes in and says, you know, we're this training program is off course or whatever, when all the problems that people come into my office to try to solve, they get to hear it. They get to see, uh, uh, non-judicial punishment, like article 15. So I get to see all of that stuff. And after each time we, I had some sort of engagement, I would sit down and say, okay, man, let me, let me, let me tell you what just happened. Same thing for meetings at the brigade. If I went and saw the brigade commander, I'd bring him along. If it were briefing, I would show him the brief beforehand and I would explain it. And I would say that like here on this, no this number and this graph, this one's going to raise some eyebrows. So I need to be prepared to talk about this number and here's why that's important. So you know, you got a lot done in four or five days. And if we were in the field, they stayed with me in the field too. But I, I was really proud of that program. And I felt like um, it was beneficial for them. 
but it was also sort of a feel good thing for me because I really enjoyed doing it. I love that you brought up that they got to see you interact with your sergeant major because that was one of the first things I thought of. And one in my in my experience, because I was not a, a, a officer, I was a non-commissioned officer, which is a, the the partner of the the commanders. And um, you know, I always hated when I get those brand new first or second lieutenants, and they didn't have the experience you gave them, and they thought they needed to come into the platoon and rule with an iron fist. And it's like, hold up here, homie, like yeah, right. this is my platoon. Like, you know, you're, you're here just to catch all the crap. And um, so, I mean, the fact that they got to see you interact with your Sergeant Major and just a quick explanation, the United States military works in a very special way that's very unique, uh, pretty much to all other militaries in the world. Um, there are only a few that I've seen that actually work the way we do. And that is we are, our powers are divided um, per se, as in you have your officers, uh, like Colonel Wells here, um, and they're more in charge of the strategery and the c command and control type things and combat, things like that. Then you have your non-commissioned officers who are in charge of the doing. Um, I think that's the easiest way to say it. And they're in charge of things like logistics and personnel and making sure the soldiers have bullets, food, and water, things like that. Um, they're also uh, work hand in hand with their officer when it comes to training and facilitating training and things like that. So the important thing is the the when a second lieutenant comes to a platoon for the first time. So we'll use my example. We get an infantry second lieutenant comes into the platoon. He's right out of college. Like the colonel said, he knows absolutely nothing about the army. Absolutely nothing. I don't care how many courses he went through in OCS or whatever, uh, green to gold, whatever the crap was that he went through like he doesn't know the army like i know the army after i've been in it for 10 16 years so it, he gets to sit and learn from from his non-commissioned officer and it's that way every single command for the rest of his life he will when he becomes a commander of a company he will have a first sergeant then when he becomes like Colonel Wells here and becomes a commander of a battalion or a brigade, he'll have a sergeant major. But in every instance, in most cases, until you've been in the army for 30 plus years, that sergeant major or that first sergeant, their time in service is going to be a little bit superior to yours. And they're going to have that knowledge. And that's the that's kind of the mentor space that the military has created. And I think that is phenomenal. Um, so I just wanted to point out that I love the fact that the, you let them see how you interact with your sergeant major, because I'm sure you're, you, you will attest like any Colonel will your sergeant major is your backbone, like 100%, 100%. <laughs> like nothing happens without sergeant major. So no, um, that's the most important relationship in the, in the unit, at least for the commander. Yeah. 100%. So I love that. Um, talk to me a little bit about other tools that you've found other than, you know, delegating and, and what you just talked about that are really instrumental when it comes to building up junior leaders? Yeah, so one thing I, uh, I, I implemented in battalion command and then it carried over into, uh, into my division artillery, the Divardi command, um, is the way I did sort of the, the unit's vision um, it's either a leader leadership framework or it's a team building framework. It could, it could be either one. We'll get to that. That's the P4. But the reason that's important is because that framework was sort of the backbone of one of the initiatives. And that is um, it sort of it, it, it was the framework for things like leader professional development, because we could always tie everything back to that. Um, whether it's specific for officers, specific for NCOs, or, or just, just leaders in general, uh, to include the, the most junior leaders we had. Um, it's also, uh, you know, you can do certain programs like your uh, equal opportunity program. It, it still feeds in into how we're, how we're building a team. Uh, sexual assault and harassment prevention program still fills in, fill, uh, fills in how we're building that team. Um, but the but the leader development was kind of the key, the backbone on this, and it was uh, really intended uh, as a battalion commander to do it more frequently than we ended up doing it. 
um, because I made some mistakes. I, I, I put this out, um, brief the vision. We got, we got some, uh, we got some buy-in and I spent about six months really hammering this thing home with the team and, and getting their feedback. And then I, I made the mistake of thinking, well, they got it now I can kind of let up. And that's just not how, how people operate. So it kind of, it, it lost a little traction towards the end and it took me another six months to kind of figure that out. Um, but in brigade command, brigade level command, Devorty, um, I used it frequently and we did a good, um, good, solid, intelligent leader development program where we focused on uh, the P4 model. Uh, and I think- Go because, ahead, and, go because, ahead and break down the P4 model real quick. Okay, so it's, it's clearly four Ps, but the first P is people. And so you have your, your thing you focus on and you sort of have your milestone. And so we wanna focus on people first and then our milestone is trust. And uh, I'll just go ahead and, and do the whole spiel on this thing. So, so we've got people and our sort of threshold to get to the next level is trust. And the way to conceptualize this is um, uh, it's based on complexity model or complex systems. So if you, if you think of your organization as agents, as just maybe little marbles or something, the first thing you need to do uh, when, you, when you have this, this uh, unit, this organization, is to create some sort of bonds between those marbles or agents, uh, between the people in the unit. And that first thing you need to really worry about is trust. Um, so especially as a leader, being cognizant of how you, uh, how you interact with everybody in your unit is important uh, because they're making those trust judgments right off the bat. And it takes, it takes time to build trust. It, it doesn't take much time at all to lose it, um, but you have to invest time and energy into building trust. So that's the first P, people. Second P is partnerships. And our threshold uh, event is, is cohesion. The thing we're looking for is cohesion. We'll get cohesion by focusing on partnerships. Again, I needed a P word. What I really mean is teams, right? Um, so here we, <clears throat> here we wanna worry about things like creating a shared unit identity. I, I want everybody to start thinking, so I've built some trust. You know, I know these people. I feel like they have my best interest at heart. Now what I wanna start doing is getting them to understand that they have a self identity and they have a unit identity and I want them to start taking on this unit identity. Now, generally the leadership, it doesn't have to be, but the leadership's got to paint reality for them and sort of explain to them the things that make up a unit identity. So, you know, simple things like what's our name and then, you know, the way the leaders behave in that unit will sort of dictate the way that others behave in that unit. And if, it, and if it's positive and it's productive, you'll start to adopt that as your unit identity. And that'll start building culture for you. So again, we'll get cohesion out of that. I want people to feel like they're part of the team. So the next P we move to is practice, P word. What I really wanted to say was uh, training or, or doing the job that you're supposed to do. Um, and so when we were in the, the previous phase in partnerships, uh, we had hierarchical structures where there's a clear leader at the top, some junior leaders under that, and the rest of the system under that hierarchical. The better you get and the more cohesive you get, you sort of transition, and again, complexity theory, so you transition into leadership emergence, where the hierarchy sort of bubbles out, and now you have sort of hot spots of leadership that aren't necessarily formal leaders. You have private first class or specialists or just junior folks that are good at what they do. They have a positive influence on those around them and they kind of know what they're supposed to do and they just do it. Um, they'll influence people around them and others that are junior will start to behave like those people. So you have leadership spread throughout. It's kind of diffused throughout the, uh, throughout the unit because of that. And what we do in this, again, is practice. So training and, and executing our duties. When you focus on that, the correct amount of time and you do it right, you practice properly, you build competence. And when you have competence, you get confident. So the right amount of training builds competence and the duties that we're supposed to do, which in turn builds confidence, which um, is our threshold event. That's the thing we need to get to, to get to the next level. And I will say the next level is purpose where my, my own identity is as, is as clear to me as my unit identity, and they both are either equal 
or in varying uh, sort of weights depending on the situation. But purpose is where people feel safe. Everybody knows what they're supposed to do. We definitely have a shared vision. And for and for you know my teams, what I what I want this phase to be is you know I care so much about my unit. If I'm doing something and I have to make a tough ethical decision or personal decision, such as you know I've I've had seven beers and I don't feel like calling anybody, but I but I I could drive home, but I'm so I'm you know I'm I'm so averse to disappoint my team or disappoint my leaders, I'm going to call those guys and say, Hey, you got to come get me. And they won't bat an eye and they'll say, yeah, great, man, let's do it. And uh, that's sort of the, you know, the external artifact of what having a really strong purpose looks like, but in the unit, everybody knows their job. They really don't need leadership because everybody is sort of self-governing. Um, if you think, and I said, this is kind of hard to get to, but if you think top tier military units, um, you don't necessarily need a lot of leadership. People know what to do and they're very driven to do it. So that's that's the sort of round robin of the P4 model. The, the threshold event for purpose is discipline. You know, one of the other things on there is this thing is cyclical, which means I don't get to start with a bunch of blank marbles and then build trust and partnerships and cohesion. What happens is marbles are coming and going at different cycles and you at some point will be the new marble. So you're the one who has to actually function or, or figure out how to build trust. And so it's cyclical in that you will get new people that will jump into the beginning, the people, while you still have a bunch of them in the purpose uh, phase, for example. So it's cyclical and it's continuous. And I know that took a long time. Thank you for letting me do that, but uh, go ahead. No, that, I, I love it. And part of the reason I love it is because I kind of, I built my company kind of around the same thing. I call it the three C's, uh, community, people, uh, consistency, and then commun uh, clarity, communication. Um, I, I believe that people are my absolute number one most valuable resource. Um, and, and that is for any organization without you know i don't need to know what organization you're in to tell you that your people are your number one most valuable resource um and then can you know uh consistency as leaders we got to show up the same way every single time um no matter what what it is and then clarity obviously communicating your vision and mission with uh clarity because people need to know what they're doing so pretty much um a more simplified version of what you got going on here um, but I absolutely, absolutely love it. <clears throat> and the, the, the first, you know, the, the people, the trust that, that, like I said, that's my number one thing. That's gotta be number one on everybody's radar because a lot of times we feel like as the leader of the, so, you know, I'm the CEO of my company, the people underneath me, um, I feel like they need to trust me. Right. Yeah, but sure. where's my trust in them? Do I trust yeah. them? You got to trust your people first, right? It's not, you know, it's not a, if they trust me, I'll trust them thing, or they got to earn my trust first. No, I have to give them my trust and then I get to earn their trust. And that's, that's the, that's how leadership works. And I've never found a shortcut. Maybe you have, I've never found a shortcut around that. Um, so no, I just I absolutely love that you that you have people in trust as your as your first P. Like that that speaks highly of uh, uh of how you run your organization slash unit. Yeah, and it's a it's a funny thing. Like when when I show this to to junior leaders, um, it makes sense to them. Um, but they understand the flow. Um, but a couple things like it's it's not so simple to to give this to a 25 year old someone who's only been a leader for a couple of years and say okay here this makes sense to you okay now go do it um so i spent a, like when we did our leader sessions our professional development that's kind of where i would focus is okay people and trust uh, it makes sense okay how do you do that um what are the things like if if you're the leader what does that behavior look like on a regular basis and i used to you know few years prior when I had this at a battalion command, I wasn't as, as clever. I, I would ask them when they came in for counseling, I would say, hey, bring, bring me some things you do to build trust. 
And believe it or not, that's a really hard question to answer um, because it's it's basically everything you do um, is either pushing trust, you know, pushing more trust, or maybe it's neutral, but it's either pushing it one way or the other. Um, so it's hard for junior leaders to, to kind of come to grips with what are the actions I need to take to build trust, to build cohesion, to build competence and confidence. Um, so that's where we spend a lot of our times is a lot of our time is really understanding, okay, how do you do this stuff? Yeah, absolutely. And it, it is hard because like, like you said, everything you do is going to affect whether or not people trust you. And, and that's uh, where my third, my second C uh, consistency comes in. It's a lot easier to, to trust someone when you're consistent. And uh -huh. you talked about that in your, in your piece. And that is when, when, you know, when I have a, a, a good PL that's in great shape, loves to exercise, you know, loves to push their body hard. It's a lot easier to get my private to act the way the lieutenant's acting, right? If, you know, yeah. my lieutenant's fat and out of shape and, you know, I'm not trying to body shame anyone here, but, you know, this is the military. So, yeah. you know, you got to be any leader. Yeah, you, you got to be fit. And so if my lieutenant's fat and out of shape, then it's much harder to get that lower enlisted soldier to, to, to follow suit because his leader doesn't match what I'm telling him he needs to, needs to be. So, I mean, consistency, showing up the same way is so key. People need to understand how you're going to make decisions. People, you know, Private Joe Snuffy needs to make his decision based on how uh, Colonel Wells is going to make his decision because you show up that way every single time you make that decision the same way every single time he doesn't even need to question the decision he knows what you would do yeah right so and that is and to me that is so paramount in the building trust is just showing up the same way every single time now a, a lot of companies um I don't think I I saw this so much in the military um it is there to an extent, but in the, in the free market, in the, in the civilian world, uh, a lot of leaders tend to prioritize bottom line over their people. Um, have you, have you experienced that in the, in, as a leader in the military at all in the army? Um, I can't yeah, think of a time where I did. So I, I, yeah, I can't give you a good example, but um, I'm sure that I've, that I've known leaders who cared more about the output of the unit than the actual people in the unit. Um, and, and that's, you can see like, and most, you know, what it looks like is, you know, here's my vision. We're going to train hard like this. We're going to do vehicle maintenance like this. We're going to do all this other stuff and it's going to be hard and we're going to be great because of that. Towards I, where I tried to start was, hey, we're just gonna we're just gonna communicate with each other. We're gonna build trust, and we're gonna kind of build this bond because I think, from my experience, you know, the, the good teams I've been on that that get the output don't just try to get the output. What what they have and it's organic and it's hard and it's if you're gonna replicate it, you gotta pay attention, you gotta understand it. But they do the output because they care about each other. Like they they like their job, they like where they are. I don't want to let that guy down because I like him. He's, you know, I want, I want him to be good and I want me to be good. So I'll do whatever I have to do to make sure we're both good and the team doesn't fail. That's where that comes from. Like I've, I've seen it in units I've been in where I, the, the units I'm happiest in are the ones where the people around me, I'm like, yeah, I, I really like these people. I'll do, I'll do whatever I have to do to make these people successful. So it just, it's just going to happen. Yeah, I agree. 100%. And, and, you're absolutely right. What the, what placing the bottom line over your people looks like. Um, I, I also agree that it, that showing up, building that community uh, or focusing on your people, you know, to go to your uh, model that that is going to organically come once you build that trust and, and that fellowship amongst your team Um the, they instantly automatically it's not about it's not i it's not how can i succeed it's how can we succeed mm -hmm. and all i've been on some amazing teams uh in my military career and in my my civilian career and i currently 
uh, am in charge of an amazing team and every single team team member it's it's how can we how can i make us successful today not how can you know what's the bottom line and, and when you focus on the bottom line like that that's literally what you're focused on the bottom right mm-hmm. i don't want to yeah. be i don't want to be a bottom feeder i want i want my brand to be world renowned like right like i want to be recognized you know as as a global leader so I, you know, we can't just focus on the bottom line. We got to focus on the future. We got to focus on everything else that's far beyond all of that. And you only get that whenever, whenever you focus on building those relationships and getting your team bought in to what you're doing. And so absolutely. Um, yeah, that I agree 100, man, that's such a good point. That's really powerful. Thank you for sharing. Yeah, that. and you, of course we want the bottom line, but your your team's not going to care about the bottom line if they don't think you care about them. You know, if if they think you're invested in them and you'll do anything for them, they're like, oh, you know, I'll work hard to make this thing work because I care about where I am. It's such a huge uh, disparity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so out of the the out of your four cycles, um, obviously, I think. I, in my opinion, I would say trust is probably the hardest, um, which, which is where, obviously, where you start. But wh- what do you think the simplest of the, your four P's is? Hmm. So there's such there's such different paradigms. Um, <laughs> you can get stuck in either one. The the one that's going to be toughest depends on you. So for example, if you're an introvert and you're uncomfortable talking to people, especially if you're such an introvert that when you try to talk to people, you make it awkward, you're not trying to, but it's just awkward. You're going to have a hard time building trust. Um, If you're very extroverted, that, that, that gives you some kind of advantage. If you go down to, let's say practice where you're trying to build competence and skills and confidence if you don't, if you don't know what you're doing, if you don't understand how to build progressive training plans, then that's where you're going to get stuck. Um, so it, it kind of all depends. Like if that's why, you know, what we talked about earlier on, you really need to know yourself at some point, if, if you don't understand this model or at least understand it enough to where, to know where you're going to get stuck, um, then you got some, you get, you get some fixing to do. Um, Right. Yeah. So I guess, I guess it depends on you. Yeah. No, I, I can totally see that. You're in, you know, now after I, after you started talking about, it, I got to thinking about it. There are people that just, you inherently trust. There's just something about mm-hmm. their, about the way they carry themselves or I, I don't know, like you, you, they just walk into the, the room and you're like, Oh yeah, I trust that guy. Like, that's, yeah. that's a good guy. Um, so yeah, I, I, after I said that and you started talking about it, it's like, oh yeah, I guess that's not the hard, that's one of the hardest things for me. And I think it's the hardest thing for me because I have trouble trusting people. So if I have trouble trusting people, they're obviously going to have trouble trusting me. So just makes sense. Yeah. And like I said, when we did our uh, professional development with junior leaders, of course that makes sense to them. But when we talked about, okay, what does that look like? Like when you, you know, you're a young kid just just from uh, basic training and you come to the unit, like just have them do that drill. Okay, what if we want if I told you start building trust right now, what would you do? What what would you do for that young uh, soldier who just came for basic training to ensure that he's on the right path to trusting you and trusting this unit? And, it, you know, when you put it like that, it's pretty obvious. I'm like, oh, if I put myself in those shoes. You know, there's a few things uh, that if you just did those for me, it made my life easier, it made me more comfortable, that immediately kind of establishes this, oh man, I, that guy made me feel comfortable. So you're on the path to trust. Yeah, absolutely. So one of my, one of my biggest things that I, I don't brag on myself a lot, but one of my favorite things to brag about is the more stress you put me under, the better I'll perform. And that's mm-hmm. totally because of the, the, the army. The army made me that way. Um, and I know that's not a unique skill to me. I'm sure you perform the, the more pressure that gets put on you, the the more you're able to multitask, the more, the faster you're able to think. And the way I describe it to a lot of people is I've, 
I've learned almost how to how to matrix my way through things, literally slow time down in my mind mm -hmm. so that I'm able to think faster and and make better decisions. Uh, but I will say the most important leadership lesson I ever learned was we were doing a uh, oh shoot, what's it called? A multi-unit a Calfax. We were doing a oh, Calfax. Okay. Yeah. Um, I, I, I don't remember what CALFAX stands for. Combined arms, live fire exercise. There you go. So we, we were training, we were doing a training, getting ready to go do the CALFAX. And, um, I was, you know, my, my, pl my platoon leader, uh, we had a great plan. We were operating in this mount site and, um, w when w our, uh, when team two got into the mount site, uh, they were leading, uh, the, the, they were the main effort, I guess. And, uh, when they got in, they just came under heavy fire. They're getting their butts kicked. And, uh, I told my PO, I was like, Hey, let's go. And I, I was an E5. I was a Sergeant at this time. So I, I was a team leader and I'm like, sir, we got to go. And he's like, no, hold on. And finally, ultimately I'm like, you know what? Screw this. Like people are, you know, my team's dying. And again, this is just training. So, you know, no one's actually dying, but it's like, yeah, man, people are dying. I got to go. And so I took my team in and systematically got every single one, including myself killed. Um, <laughs> and, you know, my, my PL handled it so well. My platoon sergeant destroyed me. Uh, my PL, um, my platoon leader, uh, he, he sat me down once we got back. He sat me down. And he's like, look, this is called a tactical pause, right? He was like, I, I wasn't being indecisive. I wasn't um, trying to think of the decisions I needed to make. He's like, I, I was taking a tactical pause because there was information I didn't have that was pertinent to the mission to get us to where we could save them. And he was like, you rushing in without that information resulted in the results you got. I was trying to avoid that. So I took a tactical pause. And that that's when I really learned, like, holy crap, like, sometimes the best decision is just to wait a second, just pause, slow everything mm -hmm. down, take in as much information as you possibly can as fast as you can, and then make your decision. Um, what, what event? Uh, have you ever had an event like that in your life or in your career? An event? Uh, I'm sure I've had plenty. Um I'm just kind of conceptualizing, you know, the younger and more ex inexperienced you are, the quicker you are to sort of snap to a decision because you haven't, you haven't had the experience to know how many variables there, there are that you just don't know. And, and I, I can definitely say that about myself. The younger I was, the, the less concerned I was or the less, you know, the lighter decisions felt. And as, as I get, you know, more senior and more senior and then, you know, to the you know, my last command, um, I'm not so quick to make decisions because the problem sets are bigger. The consequences are of, of failure are, are much greater. Um, but it, but it certainly does work out that way where you can sort of just make a snap decision and just go when you're, mm -hmm. when you're in those junior positions. Yeah. Yeah. And it was so embarrassing, man. Like that was, it was, it was horrible. And, and you know, at the time, you know, at the time I was on my, on my golden pedestal, right? Like I, I was Sergeant yeah, of course. Morris. I was great at what I did. Everybody loved me. I was a great uh, pl a team leader. You know, I, I was the platoon sergeant's go-to guy. Um, and that just knocked me right off my high horse. And <laughs> it, it was a great thing, you know, because we were training to go to combat. And so, you know, those are things that can't happen in real life. Fortunately, it happened in training, not in real life. But I mean, as leaders, I feel like once that high pressure situation starts to come and we start to feel that pressure, that's when those snap decisions like you were talking about, that's when we feel like we have to make a decision. And that's definitely what I felt in that moment. But to, to my P to my platoon leaders, you know, credit, he was able to just kind of sit back and refine the situation a little bit. And I, I think that's a, a, a place where almost everybody needs to grow is we need to chill when, whenever the pressure gets high, we need to chill and, and just kind of, 
kind of relax and, and take in as much information as we can. And I understand bullets are flying at your face. You know, you, you don't have a whole lot of time, but you know, and that's metaphorical or literal, um, depending on what your career path is. But, uh, you know, it, it's just, man, like, I, I wish I could bottle that and sell it to people. Like, just chill, chill the F out, man. Just, just relax. And I can't tell you how many times I've said that to people, like, you know, on my team, like, they're like, ah, oh, this is on fire. It's like, bro, it's cool, man. Just chill. Yeah. Man. Yeah. We got it, comes, it. it comes with experience. Yeah. Yeah, I guess. And so, so there's that point it comes with experience. I would say it's good every now and then to sort of, to make a safe, bad decision that, that, you know, that you emotionally feel um, to sort of give you pause and, uh, you know, make you think twice before you jump at something uh, sort of impulsively again, which yeah, I'm sure, I, you know, the next impulsive decision you had, you're like, well, let me think about this. Yeah, yeah, yeah that definitely changed the way I, the way I thought for the rest of my career um, or my thought process when it came, comes to things like that. But and I call it failing softly, what you were just talking about, you know, letting people fail in a safe environment. Mm -hmm. And there, there's a soft fail and a hard fail. A soft fail is, you know, limited consequence. Um, usually the consequences are controlled. A hard fail is like you're costing your company millions of dollars, you're costing people their life. Um, that's a hard fail. So, and that's a hard thing to do as a leader is to watch someone fail knowing that they're going to fail. But that's also one of the best things you can do because my PL could have stopped me, right? He was literally right next to me. He could have grabbed mm. me and stopped me. He could have physically stopped. Me. But, and, and you know, what am I going to do? Hit him? Like, no, nah, we're in training. Like, you know, yes, I disobeyed an order, but at the same time, you know, it's training. And he didn't stop me. He didn't even say a word. He just watched me go. He knew I was going to fail, right? <laughs> And, and yeah. he let me fail so I could learn. So, I mean, that's one of the hardest things. What's, what's the hardest lesson you've learned in your 28 years? Hmm. I mean, that's a good question. So um, there are definitely hard things uh, in the military that psychologically hard. Um, and I can point to those, uh, you know, uh, during deployments, uh, losing folks on your team, um, you making know, I've got a story. Lost folks. What's that? Is that making a decision that lost folks on your team? So uh, I'll I'll tell the story. I don't I don't know uh, that it was a decision that lost folks, but but it certainly um, certainly uh, kind of played out that way. So um, I'll try to make it quick. But bottom line is, in Afghanistan, I was on a small team of roughly 10 to 12 guys and we, we we had to take some equipment to one of the afghan uh, uh outposts kind of checkpoints they had the route that went straight there which took about an hour was constantly mined with ieds so we found an alternate route which took about three and a half hours um to go that way the problem was they could always see us coming because it was fairly flat where we were and the the roads were just moon dust so it always yeah. you know left a big signature so we got out there, no problem, dropped the equipment, the sun went down. Uh, and then as we're going home, we, we, since we had pretty good luck, we decided, well, we'll take the short route. So it ended up that, you know, we hit an IED, stopped. Um, that one was fine. Uh, kept going, hit another one, uh, you know, hit two or three more. Um, and then, so we're kind of stuck in this minefield and, we had to get some guys out to sort of clear the way with, with uh, mine detectors for whatever reason that, you know, they, they didn't pick one up and some folks, some folks got killed. So it was a bit, it's a bit hairy. We had to call out a, a route clearance package, some engineers and specific vehicles to do mine detection and mine clearing uh, to come get us out of there. Um, so, you know, and I, I was in charge of that convoy. So you, you never know. And it's, you know, it's, it's not necessarily fruitful to go back and question your decisions, but, um, yeah, that's just an, an example of, you know, how, what's the right decision right now? Cause you're just not going to know. You're just not going to know. You just got to make one. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that story. And I, I wasn't implying, uh, when I said making decisions, decisions that got people killed, 
Um, I was talking about myself, not you. Um, yeah, no worries. But yeah, no, I got it. Thank you for sharing that story. And, and it, that, that's the reality. A lot of times uh, as leaders, we have to make those hard decisions that impact people and may not get someone killed. Maybe it loses their job. Maybe it affects them in a negative way. And that's just part of it. But, uh, and you're right, going back and beating yourself up for it's never, never a solid, uh, plan. Um, no. we're running out on running out of time, but I, I do want to hit one other piece because I know it's big for you. Um, you've already touched on it a little bit, but, uh, talk to us a little bit about your personal development journey, um, coming up through the military and, uh, the, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly of what it's like to really dig into who you are as a human being, who you are as yeah. a leader and, and, and how you, how to effectively apply it to your life. Okay. I'll try to walk through this as methodically as possible. So if I get, if I get off on tangents, you may have to tap the screen <laughs> at me or something. Right. Let's see. So uh, I mentioned in the beginning, I, I enlisted in 1995. So went to boot camp or uh, basic training, and I got, so that initial phase was a, a very sort of dense learning period for me. I didn't have any family in the military. So family was, or the, the military was a whole, you know, new experience for me. It was all new. When I got to my first unit at Fort Carson, which was the third ACR, third armored cavalry regiment, they were in the process of moving up from Fort Bliss in Texas. So there, there wasn't a lot of people there. There wasn't any equipment. And I was a brand new private. So there's very little supervision. There was almost nothing to do. And this is my first sort of exposure to the army. Didn't know anything. And there just wasn't anything to do except maybe mow grass or clean offices or go get furniture to, to build up these offices. So interesting experience. So I think that lasted probably three or four months. Um, and then eventually we started having these, these meetings because, you know, we're, we're not doing anything. We should have meetings every day. So as a young, you know, Sergeant E5 is started to have meetings with, with just the junior folks. And uh, one day they said, Hey, you know, there's a soldier of the month board coming up. Well, you're pretty smart. You should, you should go to that. And I didn't know what it was. Never heard of it. So yeah, fine. I'll, I'll go to it. Didn't hear about it again. And then probably a month later, they said, hey, uh, your soldier of the month board is, is tomorrow. Make sure you bring your uh, your class A's in, the dress uniform. Yeah, sure. No, didn't know what it was. And yeah, no problem. So you can imagine when I showed up the next day uh, and went to the board, which is a very uh, fairly rigorous board where you're just supposed to basically memorize a bunch of manuals and and say things right and, and do some uh sort of drill and ceremony in front of the board. I think the board president at that one was a, a, a first sergeant because it was a, a relatively small board. But regardless, what also happened was my platoon sergeant, my new platoon sergeant who just came from being a drill sergeant for four years also showed up that day and watched me fail miserably in front. Of, I, I couldn't answer any questions. Uh, watched me fail miserably in front of this board. So that was that was how I was introduced to him. Who, who he actually became a mentor over the next three years, and he was the one who not only suggested I go to OCS because I had some college, but um, sort of forced me into it because it was the right move. Um, you know, it, back then when you had to type all your forms on typewriters and all that, it was it was a bit more painful to do the to do the the packet to get approved to go to OCS. But anyway. Uh, that was Paul Mahoney. Paul Mahoney was a major influence on the on the way I saw leadership throughout the the initial phases of my career. All right, so I'm going to pause there because that's like that's like the first ten percent of it. So I'm going to try to hurry up. Any questions on that before I continue? No, I will say for the non-military people, a army board is one of the most stressful. Th I would rather get shot at <laughs> all day, every day. That's so true then go to a freaking board. It is the most stressful. It's not, it's humiliating, but for no reason, they don't do anything to humil humiliate you. It's just humiliating for some reason to me. I, I can't, I can't find adequate, adequate words to describe it. It just sucks. So yeah, imagine there, there's no, there's no civilian equivalent, a job interview, but like probably 10 to 12 times more stressful than yeah. a job interview. Because yeah, you have to memorize a bunch of stuff. So imagine him standing in front of 
all these high ranking people to him having his brand new platoon sergeant there and not knowing shit. And it it is, I can only imagine the fear and humiliation and stress. You were probably sweating buckets. You probably lost 10 pounds. That's just it. I I was still so new. I didn't know what was going on. Oh, really? Yeah. He's because I got through about three questions and I just said, I don't know. Cause nobody, nobody helped me practice anything. Oh, and wow. then okay. when I knew it was serious was when my platoon sergeant, he said, come outside with me. And he's, he started doing a platoon sergeant thing. And I'm like, Oh, Oh yeah. I should have. <laughs> now okay. I see. <laughs> so it was a, it was more humiliation after the fact. Yeah. So, yeah. Gotcha. But anyway, I just wanted people to understand like a military board. So whether it's soldier of the month, soldier of the quarter year promotion, um, cause you have to go through a promotion process and go through a promotion board. That is some of the most stressful stuff I've ever done in my life. And it is not fun. It sucks. So anyway, go ahead. Yeah. So like I said, he, he was a big influence. I was a great leader. Um, very knowledgeable, very competent, extremely high confidence. Um, but, but didn't belabor, uh, his role as a leader, with with the junior soldiers it was you know we're all in this together we're going to do a great job you probably don't know what you're doing i'm going to help you out and and get you to where you're competent um but but it was it was it was a good a good part of my career that i look back very positively on even even with that one example okay so i went to officer candidate school from there which was him pushing me so i went to officer candidate school um, from officer candidate school, I got selected to go to the A second airborne at Fort Bragg. Um, so that's an airborne, you know, you jump out of perfectly good airplanes. So before you go there, you have to go to airborne school. So I went to OCS, then I went to airborne school on my second jump. Uh, I didn't keep my feet and knees together cause I didn't pay attention. And I broke my ankle on the second jump, like broke it pretty bad. So I went to the hospital, I got a medical metal plate and screws in my ankle still. Um, so from there went to, I didn't finish jump school. So went to the officer basic course, which is after officer candidate school, you go learn your branch, which field artillery for me. So that's about six months long, which is just the window required for me to heal from my broken leg. And also outside the window where you could just go back and make up your jumps. You had to redo the whole airborne school again. So I went, to, not that it's hard, but it's, 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 it's much less interesting the second time you go through it. I'll tell you that. Right. I can imagine. <laughs> so anyway, so finished airborne school, went to eight seconds, spent my lieutenant time there. Uh, while I was there, also finished my bachelor's degree, which is a great deal. The military gives, you know, if you stay in long enough and you know where to look, you get all the, the really good benefits out of the military. Um, so did, I got promoted to captain after that, went to, Fort Hood, uh, did a first tour in Iraq. Um, it was 2003. I think we got over there in uh, April of 2003. Um, so right after the initial invasion, that was an initial, uh, that was an interesting year um, where a lot of the things up until then, I kind of been doing the, you know, the army kind of felt like office work where you go, you know, go to the field every now and then. In Iraq, the first time we were, in the middle of nowhere, it was me and probably 30 soldiers and on a kind of a big, not quite a mountain, but a hill sort of on the border where I ran is. Um, and I was, I was in charge. I was a young captain before I took command as a, as a captain. So I was in charge and I was making decisions and I really wasn't confident in what I was doing. I was doing the best I could, but wasn't sure if what I was doing was the right thing or not. And I had NCO, so we were, we weren't going to get off you know, off track too far. Um, but a, a very formative part of my career where I truly understood what it, what it felt like to, to be in charge. Like there's no one else, man. It is, it is you. So if something happens, this is you, this is, you know, you're responsible. So that was, that was a big deal. So that was, we were there for a year and we ended up moving around a little bit. I think we were on that Mount for about six months, went back to Fort Hood for about a year, went back to Iraq for another year, not, not too much exciting happened uh, at that point. Skipped a bunch of stuff. Like I said in my bio, I, I was lucky enough to be able to teach combatives, which is basically uh, 
the army fighting, which kind of looks like MMA. Um, so I taught combatives to young cadets. I taught boxing to young cadets. I, I taught the weight training. I'm a big weight lifter. So uh, teaching at West Point, uh, I almost would have done it for free because it was exactly the things I love to do. Um, <laughs> it was really fun. That's awesome. um, kind of did my major time. You know, the major time is always stressful. That's the uh, that's the hard stuff where you know you're not gonna you're not gonna get a lot of time at home. You're not gonna get a lot of sleep. Got through that. Did my battalion command, and that's sort of where you know that was very formative in that uh, uh, it was one of the best jobs I'd had. It was the best job I'd had thus far. Still low enough that you are able to interact with your soldiers all the time, uh, but high enough that you have such a such an outsized impact on on what you're able to do. Um, and then I'll just skip over the rest of it because it wasn't all that interesting, you know, here and there. Um, but Brigade Command, uh, the Devardi Command was great. We did a bunch of really cool, really new, unique exercises. And I got to spend the last five months uh, of my time in command over in the Baltics uh, between Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. Um, unfortunately, it was the winter, and the winters there are, are <laughs> legit. Uh, so, uh, but it's winter in Estonia sucks. Oh, it was, yeah, it's like, it's, <laughs> I'm from Texas, man. So this, that is that is winter. That is a new kind Real of cold. Winter. Yeah, and it was icy, and it was just oh, it was tough, man. but uh, it was fun. So, and now I'm in Africom, uh, working the current operations. Um, so, I'll be here for a couple of years, and then uh, I'm not really sure what I'm going to do, but I'm kind of I'm kind of easing my way out of the military. Uh, so, I'm looking for looking for a new job. Maybe I'll do some podcasting. <laughs> right on, right on. I love it. And, and so out of all of that, what is the one thing? And I'm going to guess, I'm going to guess it was that board where you met your platoon sergeant. But what what's the one thing you would not be the man you are today without? Like without a doubt that you could not replace? Yeah, that's, that's probably it. I mean, you learned like in 28 years, man, there's so many, there's so many sort of, uh, formidable points in your career um that they and they just add up but yeah so let's so because of that board because me i failed and my platoon sergeant didn't let me get away with it and ended up being probably the 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 best leader i've had in my whole career um that i got to start off my career with and uh he he taught me the way to see myself in the army and the way to see the army so yeah, I think you're right. I wasn't sure I was gonna go with that one, but the more I talk about it, um, that was really formative for the, the following 27 years. Yeah, right on, love it. All right, brother, so uh, we're out of time, but I, I wanna thank you again, Colonel. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your stories and uh, your P4 method. Um, I absolutely love it. Um, gonna have to talk to you offline some about it and, and learn some more about you and your your p4s um because it's really cool uh yeah, for so sure. i appreciate you uh taking the time uh to come talk about that most importantly sir thank you for your service um 28 years is no joke in the army people um i i, I cannot i just can't wrap my head around it. like how, how how the hell is your body lasting for 20 that that's just good dna i guess i don't know it's funny you say that i had knee surgery about six weeks ago so i used the holidays to recuperate from knee surgery yeah just it's uh, getting the toll me. it takes on your body is insane yeah. um you know i i got shot and i didn't have great i, I was blonde blonde hair my, my beard when it would grow out was blonde i got shot and uh while i was recovering my hair just started turning gray <laughs> so yeah. like the the stress like and, and i don't blame all of my gray on uh on getting shot uh, you know it's like 50 50 just 50 percent army in general and then 50 percent getting shot but like the toll it takes on your body is insane um 28 years sir like i cannot yeah. even good god but uh anyway <laughs> Um, so, uh, I'm going to have all of, uh, the Colonel's links, uh, below in the show notes. So make sure you scroll down if you want to 
connect with him and uh, dig into his P4 model even more. I'm sure he'd be happy to do that. I'll have his links down below in the show notes. Of course, uh, my links will be down there well as well. Make sure you give me some love. Um, but before I let you go, Colonel, uh, everybody on the show has to answer one final question, which is not rehearsed. Um, none of this is rehearsed, but you know, I don't warn this part. And that is, uh, what is your best advice for someone to lead like a champion? So best advice. So really it's, it's understanding the value of leadership. But I think once you understand the value of leadership and you understand the value of cohesive teams, you're going to put the energy into making sure you're the right leader for the team you lead because it's you know each team is different each leader needs to be different for that team so that's it i love it i absolutely love it all right sir i appreciate your time again i appreciate all of you listening that's going to wrap it up for this week's episode of the red island leadership podcast i will see you all the same time same bad time same bad channel and in the meantime everybody don't forget, lead like a champion. Goodbye, everybody. No one does it